are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs> Let's go and start this round. Welcome, everybody, to another great episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. How are we all doing today, folks? Have you had a good time? Have you had a nice weekend? I know I did. It was definitely nice. It was definitely relaxing. It was all good, you know? It was definitely nice. But now that we have all calmed down for the weekend, it's now time to go and re-energize with this podcast right here, right now. And by the way, I just want to tell you this right now, and uh, I won't be repeating this until like the very end, but this is just to tell you, you guys should tune in at the very end of the episode because I actually have a little surprise for you all. I won't say what it is, but just tune in at the end. And I understand that these podcast episodes, they can last a long time. They usually run upon, they, 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 they go for like two hours usually, but consider that as a little reward. If you stay until the end, then you'll be treated with a very nice surprise. And uh, also, before I go and do begin, I just want to have a, uh, a a quick mention that there are a few significant people that have unfortunately passed away in the past week. Uh, you probably are aware that during last week's episode, there was uh, Ruthie Thompson that has unfortunately passed away at the amazing age at 111. And this was a woman who previously worked at the Walt Disney Company doing several different jobs where she worked uh, in several different areas, including uh, screen painting and uh, or screen cleaning or something like that. But uh, like uh, she is also known as an ink and paint uh, person where she worked from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves all the way up to the Rescuers. So uh, she was definitely known as a major Disney legend and especially uh, having the record so far as the oldest person ever to have worked at Disney at 111, so may she rest in peace. Uh, there was also Brian Gobbler, who was the uh, the CEO of Hasbro, whom his cancer really hit him hard, where uh, he took a leave of absence to go and have a cure for his cancer, and then a few days later, just suddenly gone. So that was kind of a, a surprising news right there, so may he rest in peace also. And finally, a few days ago, there was also the passing of uh, a significant animation figure by the name of David DePatty, who collaborated with animation legend Frizz Freeling in order to co-found uh, DePatty Freeling Enterprises, whom you probably recognize back in the 1960s, where they were the ones who carried the legacy of the Looney Tunes, as well as also producing plenty of other uh, commercials, TV intros, like for I Dream a Genie, and also being the creators of the uh, Pink Panther cartoons. Uh, not necessarily the Pink Panther movies, but the Pink Panther uh, cartoons that would come with it, uh, or not that would come with it, but more like uh, the cartoons that like run independently that come with plenty of other uh, characters along with the Pink Panther. So just a quick shout out to those three people. May they rest in peace and uh may their legacy live on okay so now with that one out of the way uh now it is time that i will go and ask the uh chat wall are you all ready for today's episode of animat's crazy cartoon cast are you prepared are you set let me hear it folks are you ready oh uh, let's see here yep Okay, yep, yeah, that's that's definitely nice to see. Okay, people are certainly prepared. And I think it is time that we shall go and officially get things started. And with our first story, we might as well go into the big weekend that we had. I know I said before that, oh, we had a pretty calm and relaxing weekend. But 
we had a little bit of a moment of excitement, especially from the DC Fandome, which is kind of like Nintendo Direct, except for all things DC, where they would make all their major announcements and give us little previews of what's to come with DC projects, rather they be for movies, for TV shows, for video games, for comic books, uh, for merchandising, and all that kind of stuff. Like, it was the big moment to let out all the major announcements for DC. And they got a wide range, including some minor little changes to some significant characters, including the new motto for Superman, in which now he will go and fight for truth, justice, and a better tomorrow instead of the American way. Which I think it is a well-fitting change, considering that, uh, especially with how America is nowadays, and unless America suddenly does decide to ban and criminalize nationalism and the Confederacy, yeah, the American way is pretty much the antithesis of uh, truth and justice. And besides, truth, justice, and the American way is not even the original motto of Superman. In the past, it actually was truth, justice, and tolerance. But believe it or not, and this is actually a crazy fact uh the reason why they decided to go and change tolerance to the american way is uh back in the 1950s during the red scare where they considered top where they actually considered tolerance to be communism propaganda i am not joking there so uh yeah so they, they have all those major announcements but in terms of movies there have been a whole lot uh that they have revealed in order to really hype people up none necessarily show a whole lot but they did go and preview just have a, give, give audiences a little taste of what would be to come rather it be a little bit behind the scenes of stuff like aquaman 2 and shazam fury of the gods give us a little preview for movies such as um uh dc super pets along with announcing other little uh direct to dvd movies uh and then there's also trailers for stuff like the flash in which we do have a little bit of a preview of the big comeback of Michael Keaton as his 1989 Batman. But what could undeniably be the biggest announcement of them all? The biggest news that ever came out of the DC fandom this year has to be the second trailer for what is possibly the most anticipated movie of 2022, and that is The Batman. So let's go ahead, set ourselves up, and check this trailer out. Police! Hands up! Stay still! Get out of here! Is a tool. But when that light hits the sky, it's not just a call. It's a warning. I've been trying to reach you. Find the gun! Rithers to match. I can take care of myself. If this continues, it won't be long before you've nothing left. I don't care what happens to me. It's only gonna get worse for you. Go, take it easy, sweetheart. Hear everything they say, ain't you? Maybe we're not so different. Who are you under there? I'm vengeance. What's black? Ah! 
got you! <laughs> I got you! is the batman which is going to be coming out on march 4th 2022 now i have previously talked about the first trailer when it came out several months ago and i've already mentioned that i'm really excited for this movie especially with the people who are attached to it not necessarily the actors but more specifically regarding the director matt reeves i am a major fan of his works uh in fact i definitely adore the recent planet of the apes trilogy especially the sequels with dawn of the planet of the apes and war of the planet of the apes i find those to be some of the best um sequels or some of the best movies of the last decade and uh honestly it's like even those recent planet of the apes movies i would actually consider it my favorite one of my one of my personal favorite trilogies it really is that good so seeing matt reeves taking his filmmaking skills that he already put onto those planet of the apes films and now he's going to go and do that to make a batman adaptation that definitely got me excited especially with the promise that this is going to be a Batman that's going back to his roots where this is a Batman where he will be more of a detective and trying to solve crimes and the first one I will say it definitely did sell me onto the idea especially with this interpretation of the Batman and um, especially showing a lot of promise with Robert Pattinson playing as Batman I think like so far from what we have been seeing in these trailers he's been really nailing the role but this time around with this trailer that we do have right over here uh, what they are presenting is actually a little bit more different instead of really focusing on Batman, even though like, yeah, they showed a good amount of him like fighting crime and like kicking bad guys butt and stuff like that. This is really a lot more about introducing the villains, considering the main villains of this Batman movie is going to be Catwoman, uh, the Penguin, and especially the Riddler, where uh, I, I guess you could say, or at least from the way that these trailers are framing it, the Riddler is going to be the main antagonist in which like a lot of these crimes are happening and the bat and, and Batman needs to try to go and solve these before the next big crime the Riddler would go and immediately do. While at the same time trying to deal with uh, the Penguin doing his mob-like uh, crimes. And then you also got Catwoman, who's kind of also like a uh, part love interest, part seductress as well. And I, I could tell right now that with the roles that they have presented with those actors they are really doing a solid job and they really are selling in the idea of these characters that um we already got so me like the, the their initial characters of who they are they're selling it well and not to mention like even the newer ideas of how they're presenting it like it already feels great like we got catwoman who st who is staying true to her role where like she's more like a an anti hero where at least she's giving out the feeling that she is like an anti hero where she really is seducing batman in a way like trying to be more of a lover not necessarily be like a a girlfriend per se but try to be the lover of uh, batman whom i don't think she realized yet that she is bruce wayne but then there is also the the penguin, which I believe is going to be play, played by uh, Colin Farrell. And so far, he looks like he's going to be a little bit more of a comedic villain. I'm not saying that he's going to be like really funny, but he is going to be the kind that like if there are going to be comical moments in the film, it will most likely be coming from the Joker or not the Joker. Sorry, uh, from the Penguin. Sorry about that. Uh, I can't believe I made that mistake. But like, you, like there's even one little funny moment uh, that's in this trailer, especially like when when you have that ending part where um, like the, the Penguin did this little explosion, like right, right over here. <laughs> I got you! <laughs> I got you! 
like you gotta admit that's like a little moment where like you would just laugh a little at that moment where it was like yeah i got you i got you oh crap i did not get you <laughs> like that that was a cute little moment that was that was actually a little bit funny but for the most part, the tone actually feels like it really is taking itself seriously. Like, I, I know nowadays, like, it's kind of comical to see, like, the dark and brooding Batman, especially when that has been massively butchered by uh, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, as well as Justice League, or more uh, more specifically, Josh Sweden's Justice League, where they try to do that tone, but it got really destroyed and like has been made fun of ever since but i feel like this is bringing back the more serious and dark and brooding batman but in a way that it actually feels fresh in a way that it actually does work and you do have a bit of that taste of that as well even though i did say that a lot of the highlights here are regarding uh the penguin catwoman and a little bit of the jo of, of why do I keep saying Joker? Like, the Joker is not even in this movie, and yet, like, I have this impulse to say Joker. I, I don't know. I, I uh, Like, I, I guess when it comes to Batman, like, when you when you think about the villains, the Joker is always the one that, like, you would immediately think, uh, think of the first. But yes, uh, the primary focus is the Penguin, Catwoman, and a little bit of the Riddler. Uh, but then you do have a bit of, like, Robert Pattinson's uh, Batman, where he, like, he's dealing with his struggles, where, like, there's even one part where, like, he kind of goes a, a little bit into his um, conspiracy mode. Uh, where was it? It's, like, somewhere in the middle or something like that. Like, you, you see the drawings on the ground or, like, writings, like, kind of, like, trying to see, like, where would be, like, some kind of uh, connection. I'm trying to find it. I don't really remember where it would be specifically. No, not see you in hell. Not this part, but... There's got to be, it's got to be like somewhere, or maybe it's at the start or something like that. I, I, don't, I don't know. Like I'm trying to find, yeah, there it is. There it is. Hold on. Back it up. Back it up. Back it up. Yes. Right over here. Like you see, like this is kind of the, con like kind of the conspiracy. Like this is like, we see Robert Pattinson right in the middle, right over here. And you see, like, he's trying to connect everything that like on the ground, like no more lies. And then you got Colson, Mitchell, uh, what is this? Red uh renewal is renewal is a lie savage the sins of my father like trying to really understand everything not just with the crimes that are being committed by the riddler but also trying to understand himself in a way and even seeing how the whole batman image and what he's trying to do like it really is corrupting him in a way like even alfred uh, this time played by andy circus is warning him that like if you continue down this path it's going to destroy you so, like, you even see concerns from other characters as well. But overall, I will say that with this trailer that we are seeing right over here, it, this definitely has me absolutely hyped. And at least in terms of the non-animation stuff that's coming next year, this is definitely amongst my list of, like, the most anticipated movies of 2022. And I'll definitely be excited to go check this one out. <coughs> Uh, excuse me but so far the things that they are presenting they really are nailing it um not 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 to mention as well that this definitely looks beautiful like honestly i don't think i've been this excited for a batman movie ever since the dark knight back in 2008 and it feels like it is going to recapture that superhero spirit of the batman but in a way that it, it also feels fresh. It, it, it makes me feel excited about the Batman all over again. So yeah, you could definitely count me in that I'm definitely hyped on this. I'm loving what I'm seeing so far. I love what the actors are doing. I love what the visuals are doing. And I love the direction where the story is heading with this. So I'm honestly really hyped for this. So if you guys are excited to check out this Batman movie, then keep in mind that it is going to be coming out on March 4th, 20. Oops, excuse me, <laughs> on March 4th, 2022. Okay, so with that said, let us now go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, what do you think about this trailer of The Batman? Are you guys excited for this movie? Does this add a little bit more to the hype for it? Or are you more dis... Are you not as interested onto this version of Batman as much as some others? Let me know what you think on this. Okay, 
Uh, let's see what we have here. Even if I'm more of an MCU guy than a DC guy, though uh, I did make an exception for the Suicide Squad, uh, I honestly love this trailer. I like how they're playing up the mystery aspect. Robert Pattinson's a pretty good Batman so far, and the makeup on the Penguin is still top notch. So I'm definitely going to give this a watch. Uh, also, are you sure the Batman is the most anticipated movie of 2022? Because the Chris Pratt Mario movie is right there. Well, I, I said one of. Keep in mind, I did say one of. It's not the most anticipated movie of 2022. So it's not like you could go and make me have like a little gotcha moment. All right. This is not a moment where like I just pulled a little. Wait. Wow, this thing was stupidly delayed, but. <laughs> No, but the thing is, yeah, this ain't a gotcha moment, but this is this is one of the most anticipated. I know there are definitely other anticipated movies in 2022, including that Mario movie at the end of that year, as well as Across the Spider-Verse. But this, this is undeniably on the list of one of the most anticipated movies of 2022. All right, let's see what else we have here. As someone who's only seen the Nolan trilogy, this looks really good. I think it's a really good idea that they're going down to the Casino Royale path for this. Uh, I trust the actors that they that they are involved and what the director... It, it, oh, you trust the director involved. And speaking of Batman, let's all honor Michael Caine's acting retirement. Uh, did you get the update on that? Because uh, he's not retiring, actually. He's uh, like he actually did post on Twitter that he's not going to go and retire. So I don't know, like, what's that like whole who like that whole hoopla going on. But Michael Caine actually did reveal that. No, he is not retiring and he will continue acting. Uh, but yeah, honestly, like I trust everything on this. And also, I, I, I almost forgot one aspect. I got to say that I really did like in this. Uh, it's also the music. Considering that it is going to be Michael Giamo who will be working on this on the uh, soundtrack of this already, uh, that really played a very significant role into the hype on this. And even the soundtrack, I, actually, it does feel absolutely epic. Like, let, let's just have, like, one more listen to that soundtrack. Hold on. Whoa, take it easy, sweetheart. Hear everything they say, ain't you? Maybe we're not so different. Who are you under there? Like, it definitely does build that hype. And, like, the soundtrack, even though it's brand new, definitely has that feeling that this is Batman. Like, you can hear the bat, like, that Batman feel onto it. So, honestly, that also plays a massive factor into it. And, I mean, it's freaking Michael Giamo. And, I mean, he already has a list of, like, amazing soundtracks that he has done over the years. Rather it be for, like, live-action films, such as the recent Star Trek movies or the recent Planet of the Apes movies, or even working at Pixar, uh, doing soundtracks for stuff like uh, Up. So, honestly... I'm dev so that that also plays another massive factor in why I'm excited for this. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, this trailer was very legit and awesome. Considering that Matt Reeves did an amazing job on uh, on the Planet of the Apes movies and Cloverfield, his take on Batman was surprisingly awesome and fresh. I like the ending part with the Penguin, though that he got Batman but didn't. Oh, thought that he got Batman but didn't. I wasn't really anticipated to go and watch the movie, but I know that fans will have a lot of fun with it when it comes out in March next year. Also, today is my mother's birthday. Ah, well, happy birthday to your mom then. Very nice. Uh, let's see what else do we have here now. Um, okay, so I had no interest in this movie because I'm not hugely into superheroes. It looks really cool with this trailer and the previous trailer. Robert Pattinson has done a lot of roles to change from Edward Cullen to Batman, so I don't have any issues with the casting. Catwoman looks really pretty too. Oh, definitely. She's she's definitely a beautiful woman, and so far she's very promising with her role uh, as Catwoman, so... So far, that, that's another very promising aspect. Um, also, the ending with the car coming out on the fire, freaking awesome. It's so silly, but still awesome and such a joy. Like, whee! <laughs> but yeah, I think that's definitely another great thing about it. It's like, even though the, some, this is something that seems like it will be taking itself seriously, there is still that, that element that 
feels like it will have a lot of fun with it. That's why that last shot with the penguin and the explosion has that superhero feeling where it adds more the fun than like the brooding seriousness. So there will still be that superhero element where the action will be highly enjoyable and fun to watch. But um, it, like uh, hopefully it will know that good blend of mixing the superhero fun with the, the gritty seriousness of Batman's origins. And by origins, I mean like how Batman started in the comics, not that old story with the, uh, you know, when he was a kid walking out of the theater and then his parents got shot. I think we all know that story from top to bottom. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm not really a diehard Batman fan. Uh, but this uh, kind of got my attention. The action is mind-blowing. The performance of Robert Pattinson is Oscar-worthy and is such a fresh breath of fre uh, a breath of fresh air after the Ben Affleck movies. I don't know if I'm going to see this, so yeah. By the way, have you considered watching The Suicide Squad or doing an Animat Watches on it? I don't think I'll do an Animat Watches on it, but when it comes to The Suicide Squad with James Gunn, yeah. Um, eventually, I will be planning to go and catch up on the movies of 2021 that I have yet to see. I do have a bit of a list, but eventually I will like actually put in the effort to go and watch them. Uh, let's see. I'll read two more comments before we jump into the next story. So let me just uh, see another one. All right, let's see. I didn't see it until you show me the trailer in this podcast and I try to have a relaxing weekend and watch Ants on Blu-ray for the first time. Now that I have seen it, it looked really good, though I try to avoid many clips at the same time in order to come in blind with Matt Reeves take on the Batman. Also, I bet Andy Serkis is having a good time right now after making Venom 2 uh, a hit and now star as Alfred Pennyworth in the upcoming Batman film. Oh, yeah, I think, uh... I, I think when it comes to Andy Serkis, like he's doing pretty well for himself, like as a filmmaker and as an actor. So like he's definitely reaping in in the rewards. All right. So let's read one more comment now. Uh, let's see. Did I read this one? I'll go with this. All right. What could I say? He's the Batman. Uh, when he's in the films, he's always the best. Uh, that depends. <laughs> that, that depends on which movie you're talking about, because there are some times when Batman He's not at his best. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, okay, not always, especially with Batman and Robin or Batman v Superman, but even in his worst appearances, he's usually the best things about the movie. All right, that's pretty much what I was talking about. Got a little too ahead of myself. Anyways, while I'm more of a Marvel guy than DC, I'll check this out as I adore many, many Batman media, including Batman, the animated series, The Brave and the Bold, and the Tim Burton and Dark Knight movies. So yeah, it looks like so far people are pretty much hyped up and anticipated for uh, this Batman movie. So it, uh, once again, if you guys are excited to go and check out the Batman, then keep in mind it's going to be coming out on March 4th of 2022. And let's hope that'll be a time when things actually do get better with the pandemic, because honestly... I don't think I, I don't think I, I don't think anybody is ready for another godforsaken wave to screw up our schedules. You know what I mean? All right, so now with that one done, let us go and talk about our next story. Now, we are not leaving the DC fandom just yet because there's also another major update uh, regarding a certain show that's going to be coming soon. Not a movie, but a show that I think it's really worth talking about. Now, they in the DC fandom, they have revealed a whole bunch of new seasons and new trailers for upcoming series, and they revealed a whole bunch rather it be stuff that's going to be coming on the cw or even stuff that's going to be coming out on hbo max or cartoon network or whatever now what i will be talking about technically it's not necessarily uh the biggest tv news uh that uh, that the dc fandom put out because technically that would be the peacemaker trailer but what i will talk about instead is is um honestly another batman news but this one i think it's honestly very fascinating to go and talk about and what i will be discussing is actually going to be regarding batman 
Caped Crusader. Now, this has been something that has already been revealed before. Like, uh, th this was something that people are already aware that it does exist and it will be coming soon to HBO Max. But the uh, big aspect regarding Batman Cape Crusader is the fact that this is going to be a massive collaboration between Whoops, excuse me. <laughs> uh, between three filmmaking legends and three Batman legends that shall be working together in order to develop this series. We got Bruce Tim, J.J. Abrams, and once again, Matt Reeves. They're all going to come together in order to go and develop this new animated series. And in a way, some people could say that this could be best described as a reboot to Batman the Animated Series. But one comment that Bruce Tim has made during the DC fandom, what is actually very interesting to note, is the fact that he is saying that Batman K Crusader is going to be more Batman the Animated Series than Batman the Animated Series. Now, I know that seems like a weird comment. I mean, like, how can you be more of a series more so than that series you just mentioned. I mean, that, that feels like a bit of backwards logic. Like, what does he mean specifically by being more Batman the Animated Series than Batman the Animated Series? Well, what Bruce Tim meant there is that now with Cape Crusader, he'll be able to do more than what he could do than Batman the Animated Series. Because with that Batman show, that one, you got to keep in mind, is a more family-friendly oriented series. Now, we all know that when it comes to Batman the Animated Series, even though it doesn't do anything too extreme to go and get like some kind of PG-13 or R rating, it is a very mature show. Like, it, it is the kind that does actually take itself seriously, and it is something that more so adults than children can actually find more of an appreciation, especially going into some dark themes, some serious subject matter, like really going in hard, despite the fact that it has to remain family friendly. It's a little bit like uh, Disney Zootopia in a way, where yeah, kids can watch it and they can enjoy it, but it's mostly going to be the adults that will be reaping in to what it's actually about. So that really is the case right here with uh, what they want to do with Batman K Crusader. In fact, let me go and read you specifically what Bruce Tim means uh, from my source here on IGN. As he states, um, the idea essentially is that the show captures what Tim was originally aiming for with the classic animation, including elements he wasn't allowed to include at the time. It kind of goes back to the original principles of the show that we originally came up with in the early 1990s. Uh, there were certain limitations on what we could do in terms of adult content, in terms of violence, and adult themes. He continued, My idea is basically to say, Okay, it's 1990 again. I get to do what I want to do this time. And I got JJ and Matt backing me up. And also, he does have the support, like he just mentioned, of J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves, where uh, Matt Reeves also went to go and extend that. Uh, as he puts it here, um, actually, to go into... Uh, uh, in, in fact, with this quote that I'm about to read, Matt Reeves actually goes a little bit more in depth about what's going to be happening in the show, because uh, some people are still a little bit confused of like what's going to be happening, uh, especially if this is going to be the kind of series in which we will see Batman interact with other DC heroes such as Wonder Woman or Superman or Green Lantern or whatever. Well, according to this, no, that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, Matt Reeves, uh, in how he's describing it, this is actually going to be reinventing uh, the Batmobile wheel, if you get what I mean. As he says here, there, uh, there's not the just, there's no Justice League. It doesn't exist. There aren't any other superheroes. It's Batman. You're watching this lone figure swimming through the cesspool of Gotham. It's Batman alone. To make things more difficult, this is also a version of Batman who hasn't yet poured his wealth into gadgetry. So he's going to be very low tech in initially. You know, as he develops as a character, we'll start introducing those gadgets and the audience can see how he developed the Batmobile using different prototypes. That's part of the fun of this series is we're finding him discovering these things that in most other Batman series, 
they already were there. But then you might be wondering though, okay, so we're going to be rediscovering the elements of Batman, like how he found the Batmobile or how he became friends with Commissioner Gordon. But what about the villains though? Are they going to be the same beloved villains that we know from before? Are they going to be completely reinvented as well? Or are these going to be brand are these going to be like the same villains that we know and love like from the uh, Batman animated series? Well, there is actually one comment that Bruce Tim actually did state about that. As he says, what this does is give us the opportunity to say, okay, the versions of Joker and Catwoman and Penguin, those versions that we did on Batman the Animated Series were really great and iconic. But there's a lot of different ways that we could take those characters that we hope will be just as iconic and just as powerful. And so far, unfortunately, though, we don't officially have a brand new release date as of yet, but uh, they did state that this will be coming soon on HBO Max and even on Cartoon Network. So, yeah, that's basically what we do know so far regarding Batman K Crusader is the fact that this is going to be reinventing the lore of Batman, kind of rebooting everything about Batman, Except uh, this time around, uh, they will do a lot more of the elements of Batman uh, the Animated Series, except go even further by not being scared to get into uh, adult subject matter or even go for a higher rating than just like G or PG or Y7 or whatever. That seems to be the big goal here. And... From what I'm seeing so far with what they're trying to describe with uh, Batman Cape Crusader, they really want to go and put the hype to the max on this. Like, really make this as anticipated as uh, the Batman with the trailer that we just watched. And I could totally see how there are a lot of elements here where they really do try to go and really hype this up, especially with the people who are attached. I mean, we got Bruce Tim, who was one of the big heads of Batman the Animated Series, and that, as we probably know, is one of, if not the most beloved and highly acclaimed animated series based on a superhero. There's very few and very rare uh, that you would find that is even in that same league as Batman the Animated Series. Uh, and then you also got major filmmaking legends such as J.J. Uh, Abrams, as well as Matt Reeves, whom uh, is also hyping things up with his own adaptation of Batman. So who knows, maybe there could be a secret link between what we are seeing with uh, Batman Cape Crusader with uh, the Batman that's going to be coming out. And uh, from from there, like not so from there, of course, they are hyping that element up of the fact that this is technically a reboot of Batman, the animated series, but go and push the envelope even further to be uh, like to, to not be afraid with the adult themes that they might introduce or even present um or, or even like go heavy on the violence, like really push it that far, even though the animated series does already extend uh, that violence to like to a brand new level. And like one great example is with um, Batman Mask of Phantasm. Now, that's a, that's actually a movie like technically it's a movie spinoff of Batman, the animated series. But that is the kind where like. Yeah, things do get very serious, more so than debatably some other uh, bat, like some other live action Batman movies out there. And like you can imagine like what they've already established with that, but then add in a lot more uh, where they won't have as much limitations as they would in the past. Like I can imagine that's going to be something that for many fans out there, they will absolutely be excited and especially one thing that I will say that I actually really do like in terms of the idea with what they are doing with this Batman is the fact that this is going to be a legitimate reboot to Batman and actually show the origins of several elements that that for a very long time we have never actually seen. Now, I know that 
with many adaptations, like I already said before, like we've seen way too many times of how Bruce Wayne became Batman or where he originated the whole idea and stuff like that. Uh, like, like when he was a kid and walked out of the movie theater uh, with his parents or walked out of a theater or something like that. So they, you know, they went in a back alley and then suddenly some uh, bad guy came in and shot uh, Bruce Wayne's parents Bruce is left alive, and from there, that's where uh, he got his trauma and then became the vigilante that we know as Batman. That has been told so many times. Like, like, it, like I, I think like Batman's parents is up there in terms of repetitiveness as much as the Uncle Ben story with great power comes great responsibility and all that kind of stuff. But uh, in this one, however, they're going to be looking to the origins that not many people actually do talk about. And that they do actually raise some good questions. Like, where did Batman get the Batmobile? Where did he develop his gadgets? Or uh, how did or like some other ones that maybe some people didn't necessarily think of? Like, how did Wayne Enterprises really get his fortune? I know that might be a story that has often been told sometimes, but we have a never really seen it in action like we've never fully dove into that story to see where that wayne enterprise fortune came from and also even like uh the relationship between batman and commissioner gordon like how did that develop like how did they decide to to become friends because i can imagine how like at first there might be a little bit of uh a, a little bit of complications between the police and batman in the first place so i can imagine Imagine how, like, at first, Commissioner Gordon and Batman weren't immediately besties when they first met. So with all those elements, yeah, I think it's actually a great idea where you would dive into the origins of those elements, like to really get into how Batman ultimately became the Batman that we know today. Even though this is going to be a bit more of a different version of Batman, this is technically, well, they state it's like a 1940s Batman, but still, um, like a lot of components will be about how Batman became the Batman we know today as well as like how Batman like especially how Batman uh, encounters the villains and I think that's going to be another thing that I'm sure a lot of people will be very anticipated about in fact like when it comes to many of these different superhero uh, adaptations that's often the most exciting thing is to see how these villains uh, get adapted or how will how, like what will be the new version of like the beloved villains and especially with Batman who has a very well-known and beloved roster of villains from Joker to Penguin to Catwoman to Riddler to Scarecrow to Bane to Poison Ivy to Harley Quinn to and many, 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 many more of these characters. How are they going to go and um, like come back onto this adaptation of, uh, of Batman? That's always the most exciting thing when you would see these adaptations of Batman and I'm sure like the hype will definitely be on when it comes to this one because I, I I could see that like maybe some people will demand for some familiarity like the the elements that we are familiar with when it comes to like Batman the animated series we want some of that to come back but then again, you do also have to go and change things up in order to fit in the narrative of Batman K Crusader. So I think that's also going to be a major thing that people will be excited to see in terms of uh, this Batman uh, of this Batman series is how they are going to change things up in terms of uh, the villains or how they are going to present the new versions of the villains. Because I think as much as people are excited to see this new Batman, people will definitely be excited to see this new joker but then again all this is nothing but talk and so far is it, it really is just hype because so far the only thing that we have seen so far from batman cape crusader is this uh poster 
And that's all it really is. It's nothing more but a, 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 a nothing more but a poster. We have yet to actually see uh, a trailer of it or even a little clip or anything like that. It really is just this poster. So the mystery is still out there when it comes uh, to Batman K Crusader. And if it really is as hyped up or if the hype is worth it, uh, especially with um, what Bruce Tim is trying to develop or what J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves is trying to convey to the audience. Is it really going to uh, capture the hype that they are promising? Because you got to keep in mind, they want this to be the next Batman the Animated Series. And that's a very high bar that they are setting themselves on, especially when they are promising that technically it is going to be more Batman the Animated Series more so than Batman the Animated Series. That, you know, that's an extremely massive promise that they are making to their audience. And something that will, uh, that, that could possibly end up with massive disappointment if they don't actually achieve that promise so they, they got a very they got a very high bar that they have to pass but i, I i'm sure like a lot of people would definitely trust the people uh, would, would definitely trust those who are attached to this series especially with people like bruce tim and even the addition of matt reeves as well so Ultimately, we will have to wait and see. And I mean, they are promising some major things with this show, but can they deliver that with the series itself? Is it really going to be the next big animated Batman series? Because so far, we already got some major Batman series that are going on right now, including uh, the Harley Quinn series. So honestly, like, we will have to wait and see. And I mean, they are making some good promises and they do sound pretty exciting. They do sound great. But are they able to pull that off? Honestly, I don't know. That's still something we will have to wait and see. All right. So with that said, it is now time we shall go once again to the chat wall. And I would like to ask you all. What do you think so far of Batman Cape Crusader? Are you guys excited to see this series? Uh, are you guys really hyped up with the promises that Bruce Tim and the other filmmakers are making? Or do you highly doubt and maybe you might feel like maybe Batman Cape Crusader is a bit overhyped? Let me know what you think on this. Okay, let's see what we got here. Uh, even if we have just, um, uh, even if we have just the cover art for now, I'm sure a lot of Batman fans could get into this. Capitalizing on old nostalgic fan favorites are becoming more mainstream with stuff like DuckTales and even recently with Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl with characters like Reptar and Ren and Stimpy into the roster and even Evo, uh, and even Evo attempting to bring back Marvel vs. Capcom 2 into the competitive scene. Uh, it really goes to show that people do care about old nostalgic properties and their fan base. Oh, absolutely. I think nowadays, like, nostalgia has become an extremely powerful tool. And that's exactly why we are seeing all these reboots and uh, all these remakes that are happening both on the big screen and even on the small screen, uh, on the small screen and on streaming services. Because nostalgia is extremely powerful and most importantly, it's extremely powerful profitable and there are sometimes like there are times when it can work like with the ducktales reboot or there are times when they can not work as well and uh like and th then there are times of course like probably for the most part a lot of these uh remakes would be a little bit mixed like i've often heard a lot of mixed feelings uh regarding uh, the rugrats reboot for example and um from there you can imagine, yeah, there are definitely a lot of shows and a lot of movies that are being remade and rebooted in order to capitalize on that nostalgia. And I, I and considering that something like Batman, the animated series is considered very nostalgic for many people and has often been regarded as one of the best animated series uh, or one of the best uh, animated superhero series of all time. Of course, eventually there will be a time when uh, Warner Brothers would try to go and reboot that show. Maybe not directly reboot it or bring it back, but at least find a way to like create a spiritual successor to make it feel like Batman the Animated Series. Uh, let's see what else we got here. 
the series definitely seems like it has a lot of potential, and it definitely seems like the series could try to take Batman into a different direction than other animated Batman series. However, if they are going to bring back the Joker into the series, they have to bring back Mark Hamill. However, I am a bit concerned with J.J. Abrams' involvement with this series, considering he doesn't have the best track record with handling already existing properties. Rise of Skywalker, anyone? Yeah, that is true. <laughs> you know, I wanted to avoid that aspect, but you do bring up a good point over there because it, it does happen that when it, when J.J. Abrams does try to handle already existing properties, I mean, like, he does well, like, he can do well as a producer, but sometimes, like, you give him an already existing property and, like, he could end up really screwing things over, which is what happened, of course, with the Star Wars sequels when he tried to work on Rise of Skywalker, or even debatably a little bit with the recent uh, Star Trek trilogy, like with uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. I, I like I did hear the third one was better than the than the second, but still, though, that is another one that is worth mentioning where J.J. Abrams is not necessarily the most trustworthy when it comes to handling already existing properties. But then again, like it does balance out that we do have someone like Bruce Tim and Matt Reeves also working on this. So hopefully that will make things a little bit better. And we do hope that we do get the good J.J. Abrams working on this and not the Rise of Skywalker J.J. Abrams uh, to be involved with Batman Cape Crusader, if you know what I mean. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, the way they were, uh, the way they're gonna make this new Batman animated series looks very interesting. Uh, but my question is, will they bring back the original cast from Batman the Animated Series? I was kind of hoping if Mark Hamill will be able to reprise his role as the Joker and Kevin Conroy as Batman. Anyways, I'm actually pretty interested of how Batman got the Batmobile and his gadgets, and maybe they could give out the real origins of the Joker, Catwoman, and the Penguin. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, you know, honestly, when it comes to the voice actors, I'm just going to say right now, like, I could be wrong, but I highly doubt it. I think they're going to go and find a brand new cast uh, in order to make this new Batman series. I mean, yeah, it would definitely play into the major nostalgia factor if they would go and bring back people like Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. But then again, Warner Brothers has already done that on several occasions, some of which did not really work. Like, uh, a great example would be the Killing Joke movie. Remember when they really tried to hype that up, even to the point of bringing back Kevin Conroy and especially Mark Hamill, who previously stated that he wanted to retire from the Joker? Yeah, that did not necessarily work as great as many people would hope it would. So, by that point, I mean, it is still possible they would bring those people, but then again, I, at least in my opinion, I highly doubt that they would legit go in that direction. Uh, let's see here. Even though I haven't seen Batman the Animated Series, but hopefully they would have uh, Danny Elfman back as the orchestra player. Somehow, because I love the intro uh, bat of Batman the Animated Series, but let's just hope this series brings back the nostalgia of the series. But I wish they do bring back Spectacular Spider-Man someday. I hate it when they cancel stuff right away, but hope this will be good. Well, I mean, that's a Marvel thing. Uh, I don't know if DC can do anything about that because uh, they got Batman. They don't got Spider-Man. And uh, let's be honest, the, the whole complications with the copyright of Spider-Man and like who's got the rights to what, it is still confusing to this day. So I don't know. It really is up to either like Disney or it's either up to Sony. But yeah, it's just we're at the point where, like, when it comes to the copyrights of Spectacular Spider-Man, it's just really too complicated to know, like, who can do what, really. <laughs> All right, um, I'll just read two more comments before we jump into the next one. Uh, let's see. Uh, didn't watch the full 1992 animated series, and I did watch the Phantasm movie, but I still admire the art style and a few villains created for this installment. They should, no, they must bring back Mark Hamill for Joker, otherwise it won't garnish a big audience. Also, if this is a really serious project, make it 2D, uh, not that weird CGI mix like in Bat Batman Ninja, even though it was awesome. No, I think honestly, like they would do hand like I I think for the most part, 
with uh, many of the Batman series that we have been getting so far, including a lot of the animated movies that came out directly on DVD, I think they will keep this 2D. I, I, like, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they'll go into the same direction, or at least in terms of the craftsmanship, they'll go into the same direction as they did with the uh, Harley Quinn series. But honestly, that I'm not 100% sure. We'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, finally, one more comment. Um, let's see. I've never seen any of the animated uh, Batman series, but this sounds pretty cool. I like the team behind it, and the premise seems quite intriguing. But I do have to wonder if the themes they're going to go into are going to be in regards uh, to Batman as a vigilante, since I've seen him go through similar phases in 2016 and 2012, and 2008, and 2005, and 1997, and 1995, and 1992, and 1989, and that weird one in 1966. If you get the re if you get the reference, you win a fish. Be careful with it. It bar uh, I borrowed it from some dude named Lou. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I got it there. I I understand the reference. Hold on a sec. Yeah, I do have it right here. So I do have one question for you. Where's my fish? I do get where you were going with it. Now, where is my fish? I know for a fact that it is a reference to this. So where the fridge is my fish? Oh, and some people, yeah, some people are saying it. Yeah, that they're getting it as well. And uh, some, some people are even writing whack. <laughs> like, are, are you trying to pull a Monty Python and just do a fish slapping thing? Hold on a sec. Yeah, just need to put this back. There we go. Yeah, and that yeah, and now I'm just seeing more comment. <laughs> oh, oh, so, so, someone didn't uh, someone did plan this. Oh, damn! I must have left it in the diner on Third Street. Ah, oh, man, Lou's gonna kill my pet goat. <laughs> I'm glad we're having fun so far. But yeah, honestly, there's a lot of promise with this series. But let's hope for the best that maybe, just maybe, we will see something great with Batman. Caped Crusader. Okay, so now let's go into our next story, and we're pretty much all good with the DC fandom, and let's talk about a viral video that chances are you guys have probably seen it. Uh, have you got, let me just ask you all, have you guys seen that test footage for that proposed Robin Williams movie? Have, have you guys honestly seen that? Let me, let me know in the chat wall. Have you guys seen it? Let me, let me just see. Uh, let's see now. Uh, hold on. The, the, uh, the comments will come. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. So most people didn't see this. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, well, uh, just to give you guys a little bit of context, uh, there's an actor whom uh, I did forget his name, unfortunately. Uh, like, when we're going to get into this story, uh, I will go more into it. But uh, there is an actor who decided to do a five-minute test footage of this proposed idea for a Robin Williams biopic. And in that shot, basically the little plot line that they did present was uh, one of the darkest moments of Robin Williams' life, where he was prepping up for a scene in Mork and Mindy, and the actress who did play uh, Mindy had to confront Robin Williams to go and tell him that John, uh, John Belushi passed away. Which was a very traumatizing moment for Robin because on the night before, he was actually hanging out with John Belushi doing drugs and stuff like that. But, like, he knew very well what is it that he died from. And it really crushed Robin Williams' soul and kind of changed his life a little bit. And it was a moment where everybody was just absolutely amazed, not just by the scene itself, but especially with the actor who played Robin Williams. Like he nailed that performance and captured uh, the comedic mannerisms of Robin Williams. And even the times when he would have to be serious and like what he would have to do in terms of like coping with a very serious moment like one of his best friends died uh during a moment where he could have saved him and stuff like that however there are times when people are taking it a little too far with that viral video and that is especially the case when it comes to sharing it with robin williams daughter zelda 
Yes, uh, on Twitter, Zelda Williams, the uh, daughter of Robin Williams, had to go on social media to blatantly tell people to stop sharing that viral video with her on social media. In fact, she actually stated, I'll go and read directly uh, on Twitter from, uh, d from the source where it states, Guys, I'm only saying this because I don't think it'll stop until I acknowledge it. Please stop sending me the test footage. I've seen it. Jamie is super talented. This isn't against him. But y'all spamming me an impression of my late dad on one of his saddest days is weird. And uh, to give you a little bit more, uh, uh, like to go into more of, de uh, of a detail of what this scene is about. In fact, this article on CNN actually describes it best. Um, it says here on Tuesday, actor Jamie Costa posted a five minute video on his YouTube channel in which he acts out a scene of him as Williams learning from his Mork and Mindy co-star Pan Dauber played by Sarah Murphy of the death of his friend comic John Belushi. And uh, from there, like she pretty much had to go and make that massive post to go and tell people, please stop sharing that video with her because it was at the point where her social media was just being spammed by people try, uh, trying to make her show this clip. So you can imagine how it is a little bit overbearing for her. And this is not necessarily the first time where uh, uh, where Zelda Williams had to go and face this kind of like uh, th th like this kind of overbearing amount of attention on social media when she didn't necessarily ask for it. In fact, um, unfortunately, Zelda Williams has been a target of harassment on several occasions. Uh, like probably the worst case was actually back in 2014, where it even says here in 2014, she quit Twitter and Instagram for some time after she was trolled in the wake of her father's death, which caused Twitter to revisit its user protection policies. So that's pretty much the big thing. Because of that Jamie Costa video, um, people were just desperately sharing it again and again and again uh, to Zelda Williams regarding that scene, and she had to go as far as to go and stop it. Now, I know it doesn't necessarily seem that big of a video, but I just really want to go and actually comment on that because it feels very fascinating. And, and I will say, like, as my experience as an Internet personality, even though, like, definitely not as big as Zelda Williams, there's just so much of it that I feel like is extremely familiar. Now, one thing I will say, if I could go and quickly put my opinion on it, um, this viral video, like what Jamie Costa did in that five minute test footage, I find it to be absolutely incredible. And yeah, Jamie Costa did a phenomenal job trying to be like Robin Williams. Like he, like I said before, I personally find that he did do such a great job impersonating uh, Robin Williams and his mannerisms. Now, keep in mind, I personally do not know Robin Williams myself. Uh, this is like I'm just a Robin Williams fan uh, who only knew him from like the documentaries and the movies uh, and the stand up specials that he has done so at least this is from the perspective of a fan that i find that he really did do a great job but at the same time i really do understand how this is very much messed up what people are trying to do in terms of trying to share that p that video in particular with zelda williams because one thing that you do have to understand is that she is robin williams daughter so of course that video will definitely hit differently than most other people. Like, yeah, there are definitely tons of, uh, there are definitely tons of people online that are demanding for a Robin Williams biopic to actually go and happen. And personally, I could see that working. I could definitely understand why people would love to see a biopic on Robin Williams because he's one of those, um, he, he's one of those figures that's just so fascinating to see his life and to see like everything that he went through in order to become the legend that he is today. In fact, Robin Williams is kind of like someone like Walt Disney where you could just take one aspect of his life and you could make an entire feature film out of. But um, in the case with, um, with Zelda Williams, I understand why her perspective or like how she views it it's not as strong as like plenty of the robin williams fanboys out there because the thing is when you do think about it 
what people are doing is absolutely messed up because what you are, what people are doing is sharing her a video of a guy impersonating her deceased father, reenacting one of the darkest moments of his life. So you could totally bet that for someone like Zelda, that would absolutely be something that would be more awkward than it is uh, something that would be entertaining or see that as like, oh, this is a great idea. Oh, he did a great job. This is beautiful. So, yeah, I, I, I can imagine that like it could be a little overbearing uh, to see that video and like it would definitely hit an emotional chord for her and not to, and this is not to mention how people on a on, on on a regular basis would go and share that to her like not just hundreds but like thousands of times like thousands upon thousands of people would go and spam her social media account trying to make her watch this Robin Williams video that she has already seen like it's guaranteed that she already saw it she doesn't have to see it thousands of times for every time someone would go and share it you know she like she doesn't owe you like a comment to say thank you for sharing this video oh it's great i agree with you this is beautiful this is a great tribute for my dad like no it, it, like she doesn't owe you any of that. She is still a person no differently than you. And like what people have done, like we're trying to share that clip, even though it's unintentional, this is full on harassment. And this really and the reason why I find this one, like I find this story so fascinating is the fact that it actually does highlight a very serious problem with people and their behavior online. And that is the fact that people post before they would go and think. They wouldn't even have time to think like they would see something that would happen and they would impulsively go and try to make a comment on social media. I'd rather it be like on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook or whatever. They just have the impulse to go and say something without even thinking if what they're saying is actually even a good idea in the fir in the first place or the consequences of saying that comment and that's especially the problem is that they don't realize the consequences to their actions and even though this is online and some people can remain anonymous while they would go and make that comment they're not realizing that their actions and their comments can have some real world consequences and people don't really realize that. And that's something that even I have to go and face on a regular basis. And I mean, you, you know, with the comments section, I mean like that, that's just a toxic waste dump right there, especially on YouTube, not all comments, but when they are toxic, they are like Chernobyl levels of toxic. And that is why this year I kind of vowed to just stop looking at the comment section altogether. Like there will be those rare instances where maybe I'll check out, but that's why I, I, I got a bunch of uh, moderators to go and help me out to uh, weed out plenty of the bad ones because yeah the ones that can be negative or that can be harsh like those are from people that they don't realize the consequences to their actions or even or especially even care about the consequences but yeah like like there are some that can legitimately hurt or that like they can like put a damper on my day or something like that like trust me i i would end up being clinically depressed if i would go and continuously read the comment section or try to do the moderation of the comment section myself like it, it would be that bad and uh for any aspiring youtubers and stuff like that i highly recommend that you go and, or like already established youtubers please i highly recommend that you go and and get some moderators for the comment section to help you weed out those bad comments because sometimes they can be uh, like they could truly be a true pain and like some of the worst parts of being a youtuber so i i'm very thankful for uh the moderators that i do have but yeah, like, and that, like, not only do I have to go and face that, but there are even times like I am aware even my own fans can reach that level of stupidity. I am aware that even my fans can actually go and act before they think where they need to impulsively make a comment every time I would go and make a post or every time I would go and make a video. And that really does increase the chances of, of them ended up trying to, where they would end up saying something stupid. And I had to go and interview and actually go and call them out like I, I like I had to go and say hey what the hell are you doing you just said something stupid how about you quit it 
And I mean, they're not fun. It's not fun for the person receiving the comment. And I mean, it's not fun for me, but I knew it had to be done because these people need to be reminded that, hey, sometimes you don't have to comment all the time. And sometimes these people will try to use their conditions as an excuse for saying those stupid things. Like they would say, well, I, I can't help myself making these comments because I have ADHD. I have autism. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you're autistic. Maybe you have a, a maybe you have some kind of like, well, a, a mental condition. I wouldn't say mental disorder, but you'll, you'll probably have some mental condition, but that doesn't mean you're freaking stupid. Okay. It's not that you're autistic. It's the fact that you're being stupid online. And some people, they just feel like they need to force themselves to comment all the time. And like, I had to go and intervene. And that's the sad truth with the internet is that there are some people that they don't think when they comment, they don't think when they go and make posts, all they do is just go and like, make a comment, make a comment, like just push the comment, whatever is in their mind, they have to go and express it on social media. And we are pretty much at the point, especially nowadays, when misinformation has become increasingly dangerous rather it be political or especially medical when it comes to uh this pandemic like trying to say like saying something before thinking about it if it's a good idea has become very dangerous and it is something that we need to go and discourage and start to really call out more and especially in the case with uh zelda williams like i i really do feel sorry for her and i do understand what she's going through uh like by going through this entire uh situation of like people just impulsively trying to tell her uh to check out this video despite the fact that like if they just put in a little thought they would realize, you know, maybe someone has already sent her that. Like, chances are, considering it's about her father, maybe someone already made her aware that this did exist, or she's pro or considering that it is about her father, this already does exist. And it's unfortunate because, I, I, again, like I said before, Zelda Williams is unfortunately one of these people that does... Uh, that is pretty commonly faced with uh, a lot of harassment online. And I know there are going to be a lot of people who would want to disagree with me or try to try to say like, I'm wrong on this, but let's face facts. People, the fact that she is a bisexual woman with a, with a prominent uh, platform on social media that does play a very significant factor. That fact alone plays a very significant factor onto why she's being continuously harassed online. So yeah, I definitely do feel sorry for her uh, that, that she's being bombarded with all this. Like even for someone like me who definitely did enjoy that Jamie Costa video, like I, I think it really is a bit of a step too far to even like try to try to show it to Zelda Williams. Like not even I would go and do that kind of thing because again, that's kind of messed up. Like you were like, imagine if someone would go and show you a video of someone trying to impersonate uh, a parental figure who passed away that you were very closely connected with trying to reenact a scene that is considered one of the darkest moments of their lives. You wouldn't necessarily be cool with that. So overall, I just wanted to highlight this story because it does have a bit of an important moral to say, act like think before you act. Before you would go and write down a comment, rather it be on social media, like on Facebook or Twitter, or even if you're writing right now on the chat wall, think before you go and make your post and try to consider all the consequences. Like think of the consequences to your actions. Think about how the receiver of that comment would feel if you would go and say that. Like, yeah, there's a lot of thinking that you would have to do, but it's kind of necessary before you would go and make that post. That way, you'll be a lot more considerate and you won't go and, uh, and it will be less likely if you would go and spread misinformation because that impulse, because that kind of impulse is the reason why we would end up with so many conspiracy theories, with rumors, or with uh, a lot of misinformation being spread. Because uh, it really is because of people like these that would act before they think. So really, the moral of this story is just think before you comment. So with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, 
What do you think about this whole controversy with uh, Zelda Williams telling people to back off when it comes to, okay, maybe that's a little too harsh to put it, but um, what do you think about Zelda Williams telling people to stop spamming her social media uh, with like all this uh, Rob, Robin William post? Do you think it's um, like, do you think she's right in this? Do you disagree with what she's done? Let, let me know what you all think on, on this. Let's see. Poor Zelda. Sometimes people on the internet can in, it can be inhumane. It's honestly best to judge uh, some moderator uh, ju just to get some moderators to block these self-centered idiots because they can be really ridiculous. Oh, yes. And um, one thing that I would like to add, by the way, uh, one thing that I just want to go and quickly mention is the fact that that um like the, the the crazy thing of all this is that because Zelda Williams actually made that comment to tell people to stop she this is actually something that she would get harassment for like in the past few days Zelda Williams did legitimately get a whole bunch of harassment from people basically gaslighting her saying that she's in the wrong to tell people to stop uh continuously spamming her comment uh spamming her social media with this and and, and that's kind of like um th that's another dangerous element when people would like not only that people would just impulsively comment before they would think about it but they would also have that Karen like attitude or that Karen like mentality of the customer is always right thinking that they're not the problem as anyone else if you don't like my actions then that means that's your problem and that is honestly very dangerous especially when it comes to interacting with people I mean it, it's insane the like it, it's insane to think how people do not necessarily like the way that people act when they are in real life and how they act in social media, it's like two completely different people and it's ridiculous. And like, it's crazy how people really let out their inner Karen on social media thinking that, oh, because it's online, oh, there are no consequences to my action. Nothing will happen to me if I do this. It, it, it's honestly ridiculous. It, it, it truly is. And, and, and I, I just find that so insane that some people would even think that Zelda Williams is in the wrong to tell people to stop spamming her with that video when it's when it's actually about her father during one of his darkest times. Seriously, that's just freaking messed up. All right. Uh, let's let's see what else we got here. Uh, let's see. So Zel, uh, let's see. So Zelda has every right to not want uh, so Zelda has every right to not want that scene shared to her. She's not angry at the actor or the biopic. She's just annoyed and frustrated with people showing it to her. She knows that it's one of the worst moments of her dad's life and that it affected him forever. It's her father. Maybe it's not out of malice, but that still doesn't change the fact that you are sharing this with his daughter and she saw it. Honestly, I only wish Robin could have lived uh, to see his daughter daughter's role as uh, uh, Kuvira on Korra. Yeah, and, and I mean, this is not just uh, like this is the kind of behavior that's not just when it comes to Zelda Williams with that Jamie Costa video. This is honestly something that commonly happens all the time. Whenever like whenever there is a video that is related to a person, then, you know, there's going to be like a whole bunch of people that will continuously spam them uh, with that particular video. Like if someone would go, like if someone would go and make a comment about a YouTuber and that that suddenly and that video suddenly gains traction of course you're gonna get like hundreds of people that will go at that person and grab and like try to get their attention as much as possible to continuously spam them with that video i should know that has actually happened to me in the past you probably remember about that past uh, yoshi uh, that yoshi player video like you have no idea when back during the start of 2018, I have been spammed again and again and again for weeks of people trying to show me that video when like one is often enough. I already knew the existence of it, but that didn't stop people from trying to spam me with that video, either on social media or the comments of my of my YouTube channel. So I understand that. And it's unfortunately a behavior that people have where if you see a video that re that is related to a person, they will go and continuously spam it. And again, that's the kind of behavior that people will have uh, in order to go and like uh, like they would go and act 
before they would think. They would just impulsively just share that video. All right. Oh, uh, what else do we have here? Jamie Costa's the name of the Robin Williams actor. I remember seeing an old video in which he did a variety of Robin Williams quote back in 2014, soon after Robin's departure. I thought he was spot on, so much so that I was hoping he would be the genie in the 2019 live action film uh, instead of Will Smith. And I would love to see a Robin Williams biopic, but because of what happened with Zelda, I best respect her wishes and not do anything further with this. And I just want to say right now, the truth of the matter is that a Robin Williams biopic would not happen for a very long time, as much as it would be a great idea. And I do agree. I would love to see a Robin Williams biopic. That would actually be cool. The truth is it ain't going to happen because it actually states on Robin Williams will that no one can do that. In his will, Robin Williams did actually specify that no one should do any form of impersonation of him, uh, rather it be in movies or TV shows or anything like that, for the next 25 years. Ro like, no one can be like Robin Williams or try to impersonate Robin Williams. Like, yeah, Disney would be allowed to use archived footage of Robin Williams uh, while he was recording for the genie in Aladdin. They can do that. Th they can do that fine. Like, that's okay. But... At, but, but afterwards, like anything else, like trying to add on to like the genie character or try to make a Robin Williams impression, not many people are really allowed to do that, or at least for commercial purposes. So I just want to highlight the unfortunate reality of that. Uh, let's see what else we have here. I have yet seen the viral video, but I honestly feel really bad for Zelda Williams, seeing how she's been through so much, even right after Robin's, uh, Robin's death. As you said, people need to think before they post and consider the consequences of what they say, and as such, Zelda gets my full sympathy. But I guess we need something to lighten up uh, this little, uh... I found a fish! Anyone still wants the fish? Oi! Mate! I still want the fish! He's got the fish, people! Get the fish! We need to get the fish. He's got the fish, people. Ring the bell. He's got the fish. <laughs> I just wanted, just wanted to light up the, you know, lighten up the situation because you know that would be something that Robin Williams would do. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see what else, what other comments we got. Uh, hold on a sec. Where where are we? Uh, there we go. Uh, some people on the internet really seem to be lacking either self-control or common sense. I have seen the video yet, but, uh, uh, certainly feel sorry for Zelda who has to endure being told about one of the worst moments of her deceased father over and over and over again. Also, as someone who does have autism, let me just say that having certain disorders like ADHD, Asperger's and autism is no good excuse to be this stupid. Exactly. And I mean, yeah, it might look bad on my end, but I just want to say right now that I will not hesitate to call out anyone who would go and make some kind of stupid comment, even if they would be like a devoted fan. If you said something stupid, I will call you out and try to tell you to just shut up. Because seriously, there are some people who are too stupid to have a keyboard. Uh, let's see, I'll read one more comment before we go and move on to uh, the next uh, story. Uh, let's see. Uh, I didn't see the viral video, but that one has just gone too far. I felt pretty bad for Zelda Williams. The fact that people are harassing her was a huge zoinks, if you know what I mean. Uh, and if you're complete and you are completely right, Matt, it would be very dangerous if we spread misinformation the next time. Uh, when we comment and write our opinions and saying we should think first before doing anything. Thank you for giving us a great moral. So, yeah, exactly. It's just something that you guys need to consider. And again, this is a, this is the big moral of this story here. You got to think before you post because you never know if you're doing more harm than you are doing good. Rather it be to the person that you want to send the message to or to 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 pretty much the the situation that you are discussing about so just thought i would go and mention that okay so whoo i got a subscriber <laughs> thank you so much to uh pnn legend for that subscription that is uh very nice of you 
All right, but anyways, uh, let's go back to uh, our next story right over here. And what I got, uh, by the way, good news, we are going to lighten up the mood right over here. So don't worry, things are going to be fun again. Things are going to be like, you can go and do a little... <laughs> so you can have those fun times. But with our next story, one thing that I will say more so than it is fun, I will say... This is actually intriguing. I do find this very interesting because they are bringing back a series that for a few years ago, they said that this is going to be over. But of course, they are bringing it back in a very interesting way, a modern way, you could say. So what I got over here. Yeah, some people are mentioning, oh, is it going to be Home Alone? Nah, 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 nah. A lot more interesting than that. What I'm going to be talking about is going to be the comeback of dragons in the nine realms. So let's just go and check out this little teaser. You want to hear a story about dragons? Everybody's got a favorite, right? But I've got a dragon story you haven't heard. And this one is my absolute favorite. Because this story is mine. Yes, folks, it's a very short trailer. It's about like half uh, half a minute long. But what you just saw there was the trailer for the upcoming animated series Dragons, the Nine Realms. And yes, this is a new series from How to Train Your Dragon. In fact, if you want to know a little bit more info of what we have just witnessed here, let me go and read you from my source here on Animation Magazine, where it states about what this is all about. Set 1300 years after the events of How to Train Your Dragon, dragons are now just a legend to the modern world. When a geological anomaly opens up an immense miles deep fissure in the Earth's surface, scientists from all over the world gather at a new research facility to study the mysterious phenomenon. Soon, a group of misfit kids brought to the site by their parents uncover the truth about dragons and where they've been hiding a secret they must keep to themselves to protect what they have discovered. And so far, they have revealed uh, one person that is going to be in the cast, and that is actually going to be the next hiccup, if you will, who's going to be voiced by none other than Jeremy Shada, who you may know him more as the voice of Finn the Human in Adventure Time, Lance in Voltron Legendary Defender, and Robin in Batman the Brave and the Bold. So that's pretty much the big thing about this is that how to train your dragon is back, but now set in the modern world. And I will say from the looks of things over here already, I do have several questions like, uh, of course, considering this is a how to train your dragon series, of course, the main character's dragon has to be a night fury. But what is actually very interesting is the fact of the uh, Night Fury itself, because if you do look closely at that particular uh, Night Fury, you'll find that it's actually quite familiar. It, it, it actually looks like the Night Fury, who is one of the kids of uh, Toothless and that uh, white Night Fury, you know, that that shiny Night Fury, if you will, for Pokemon fans out there. Uh, so yeah, it, it does look like it's one of the kids, but it does raise the question, and I don't know if this is something that they've already established in How to Train Your Dragon lore, how long do Night Furies age? Because like, yeah, they, they are dragons and you could expect them, oh, some people are saying Light Fury, oh yeah, it is a Light Fury, it's, it's been a while since I've seen, uh, Dragons 3, I will admit, uh, <laughs> yes, 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 I do mean, I do mean the Light Fury, but anyways, um, as I was saying, one thing that I'm not sure about is how long do Night Furies live? Like, I'll buy the fact that dragons can live to, like, over a thousand years old, but you gotta keep in mind, if this is Toothless's kid, then 
yeah, like that that would pretty much mean, according to the to the synopsis, that this dragon is 1300 years old and it still looks like in prime shape. So I don't know, like that is something that I feel like I have to question. Like, I get it. I get that we need to have some familiarity uh, in terms of how to train your dragon. So, of course, if you're going to make a how to train your dragon series or make some kind of how to train your dragon reboot, then you got to make the main character or the dragon of the main character a night fury. So you can have a bit of that familiarity with Hiccup and Toothless. And that's kind of what they are doing over here. But one thing I am wondering is. Are they like, is this actually uh, Toothless's kid or is it just or or are, are they going to do like this is an ancestor to Toothless and the Light Fury to the point where like the all the Night Furies, they they look, uh, you know, they look uh, like, like they, they look mixed where they are both black and white all the time. That's how all all Night Furies are by that point. I don't, I don't know, like. That, that'll probably be something that they need to go and answer. But the big thing that I will say is actually strangely interesting is the fact that, of course, they are bringing back How to Train Your Dragon, but in the modern world. Now, it's funny to mention how, like, technically, the whole big deal about How to Train Your Dragon in the Hidden World is that it's supposed to be the grand finale of the How to Train Your Dragon franchise. This is supposed to be the big finale of the plot line with Hiccup and Toothless. I mean, sure, technically, there was that Homecoming Christmas special that aired after uh, uh, How to Train Your Dragon the Hidden World, but still, technically, we should be at the point where the whole narrative of Hiccup and Toothless is supposed to be done, meaning that we should be done with the How to Train Your Dragon franchise. But I guess Universal does not want to let go of the uh, How to Train Your Dragon franchise, and there is still some money that they need to squeeze out of. And I, and I don't I don't necessarily mean just with, like, maybe with the uh, Universal Studios, and they would go and make rides and shows based on How to Train Your Dragon. And apparently, um, like, uh, one of the new recent uh, Universal Studios that opened, I believe it's, like, in Beijing or something like that, uh, they, they actually opened up a How to Train Your Dragon show, and apparently that one is said to be absolutely phenomenal. So just thought I would go and quickly mention. But um, considering that technically, like, it's supposed to be done, yet they want to go and make more, which is why now they're going to do one set in the modern world. And that, I will say... I don't, like, for me personally, I'm not sure. Is it really worth trying to bring back the How to Train Your Dragon franchise and bring that to the modern world? That just seems a little bit weird, and it seems a little bit confusing. That's like if you want to do the same thing with Shrek. Like, you want to bring Shrek into the modern age, like some kind of magical spell where suddenly Shrek and Donkey and Puss in Boots and the rest of the gang, they would all suddenly be magically teleported Onto the modern world. It, it, it seems like it would be that kind of similar feeling. It just, I, I don't know, it, it feels out of place because How to Train Your Dragon does establish itself to be in this medieval world or to be associated, like, How to Train Your Dragon is a franchise that's heavily associated with Vikings and dragons, where, like, you got the time of the Vikings and that's when they would have dragons. And, you know, that 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 really does help really put in that storytelling lore onto it to really enhance uh, that storytelling immersion of the fact that it's kind of like telling us a fairy tale of like a grand story with Vikings and dragons and how they used to hate each other. But now they collaborate and seeing a society of Vikings and dragons collaborating together to be as one and create this entire civilization, you know, like there was there was this magical unique immersion this unique world that's going on but now trying to bring that to the modern world that i'm not a hundred percent sure i don't know if that really seems like something that would be a good idea and it just feels more like universal trying to really cash in and squeeze every ounce of money they can get from this one particular franchise and not to mention like especially with the plot line that they are presenting with um <coughs> Uh, sorry, uh, something went in the wrong hole. But anyways, um, when it comes to Dragons, the Nine Realms, it's just with the whole plot line with what they are bringing up. It honestly feels a lot like they're trying to do something similar 
to Jurassic Park uh, to Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. Like you know that animated series DreamWorks is uh, DreamWorks is doing uh, based on the Jurassic Park franchise. It really does feel like. It really feels a lot like that, where you got these misfit kids uh, that are interacting with dinosaurs. But instead of dinosaurs, now they're just interacting with uh, with dragons. And not to mention that it's all going to be set in like this science, uh, like this science facility where they're trying to learn more about like the phenomena that's currently going on. But again, instead of dinosaurs, it's this um like this situation that's going on where like the earth opened up a little bit because of the earthquake. And now the kids have discovered a dragon that, or they're just, dis they've discovered dragons that they want to keep a secret to their parents. I don't know. Like for me, I I I'm just, I, I just don't know if this really is an idea that is worth pursuing. And especially that right now, like we do have camp Cretaceous that does have a similar plot line and is already seeing some significant success so far. Like I, I will admit it's already becoming more successful than even I anticipated, anticipated it to be. But I, I don't know for me, I, I just feel like there's just something off and the, the, like it kind of leaves a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth of really trying to bring back how to train your dragon in that sense. Now, one thing I will give it credit, though, is that in the teaser trailer, one thing that I do like to see is that they got more new ideas for dragons. And that's something that I thought is really cool. Like you you, you do see like on the sides where um, where they would show like the ideas of what they would have for a new dragon. Like like you got this big one with a mountain for a horn uh, that honestly that but like, like this one, it reminds me of um, I, I forgot his name, but. It, like th this reminds me of a Pokemon. Like th this is one of the new Pokemon uh, that came out in Sword and Shield. Like a uh, tur, tur uh, like a uh, tur, tur like you you know the one that's like a turtle but has this big horn. Uh, you guys can fill it in. Uh, like you guys can fill it in in the com in the comments or in the chat wall. You probably know which Pokemon I'm talking about. The one that looks like a turtle and he has a horn. Dreadnought. Yeah, exactly. Like. We got the How to Train Your Dragon version of Dreadnought. Like, he looks exactly like that. And then you also got this two-headed dragon. Um, like, he does look familiar. He does look the same as, like, one... Like, he he does look like a mix of the already existing dragons that we got. The the, the one that, like, would continuously spit fire. And the two-headed ones uh, that, like, would either spit out gas or would spit out spark. So like you got like you got those dragons like those designs are actually pretty cool. And then we would get another one happening, which is right over here. Like we got like we got a like a long neck mini dragon. And then on the side, of course, we do have another Night Fury, of course. So at least like that's one benefit of this How to Train Your Dragon series is the fact that we are getting this, uh, oh, and some people, yeah, <laughs> some people are, 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 are even connect correcting me, like bringing up like the other dragons that are, are mentioning. Yeah. Like the Chinese Hydra and yeah, rough nut and tough, uh, tough nuts dragon and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Of, of course. Like I, I do get what you mean, but the point is, is that, um, I'm definitely down for the idea of introducing more dragons to the franchise. I think like that's easily one of the best parts of the world building of how to train your dragon is to see the variety of different breeds of dragons that they would have in there so like we'll probably see some familiar dragons in there some new dragons as well so that would definitely be cool but the whole idea of bringing the how to train your dragon franchise to the modern world that is still something that i am honestly iffy about i just don't know if this is an idea that I could honestly be cool with. So I don't know, like uh, maybe some of you might have a, a different opinion on this. Some, some of you might think it's a good idea. Some of you might think it's not, but honestly, I, I don't know. Like we will have to wait and see with, um, how this series will go. And if you are interested in seeing this series, if you really want to know how Dragons the Nine Realms is going to be, then keep in mind that it's going to be coming out on December 23rd on uh, Peacock and on Hulu. Interesting choices, not on Netflix, but more on Universal's own uh, streaming service, as well as Disney's uh, second streaming service as well, technically. 
which does make me wonder it. Does that mean I'm going to get this on uh, Disney plus as well? Uh, who knows? <laughs> ah, I'm just fooling around. All right. Uh, anyways, uh, let's go into the chat wall right now. And I would like to go and ask you, how do you guys feel about dragons? The nine realms. How do you feel the fact that they are taking the how to train your dragon franchise and put it in the modern world? Do you think it's a good idea? Are you guys hyped up for this uh, series or are you guys a lot more iffy? Are you not sure that this could work out? Let me know what you think on this. Okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. Don't you think this is kind of kills off the don't you think this kind of kills off the world building of how to train your dragon uh, aside from the legend of Korra and a bit of Pixar's onward. This also kind of reminds me of lunatics unleash. It takes place in the year 20 uh, 27 72 and things are a lot darker grimmer and a lot less funny completely destroying what the lunatics ancestors the looney tunes were known for wacky zany comedy in any situation while the tone is still there i, I this feels a bit alienating exactly like i i feel like bringing bringing dragons to the modern world it really destroys like a significant factor of how to train your dragon in the first place i mean it's not just about the dragons but it's also about the world of burke you know it, it, it's about like uh you know it's about this viking civilization where they learn to coincide with dragons and that's what makes like you know that's a significant factor into the identity of how to train your dragon and losing that i feel like it really is losing a major part of his identity so so honestly i agree with you there uh, let's see what we got. As someone who is a fan of How to Train Your Dragon, I am a bit mixed. On one hand, I am happy to see Universal is still interested in doing new things with How to Train Your Dragon, but on the other hand, I'm unsure about taking place in the modern world. It kind of reminds me with what My Little Pony A New Generation did, where it takes place many, many years in the future and has modern technology, so we'll see. Also, I do think the dragon is Toothless and, Light and the Light Fury's kid. Again, if that's the case, like that's something that that is honestly something that the series really needs to to explain. The because I don't know if this is really a thing that uh, the How to Train Your Dragon franchise has really talked about the longevity of uh, or the lifespan of a dragon, especially for a Night Fury, considering that. They have mentioned that they, that night furies are extremely rare, and for a while we we have often thought that Toothless was the only one until the Light Fury came in. So that is something that they really need that they really need to go and answer questions. Or I mean, considering how long they live, are we actually going to see Toothless in this series? Who knows? Uh, let's see now. Uh, as someone who enjoyed the three How to Train Your Dragon movies, I'm not entirely sure. On one hand, I'm interested in the idea of seeing this fantasy world actually having advance into the modern era, and I do enjoy the How to Train Your Dragon series in general. On the other hand, this doesn't exactly feel like How to Train Your Dragon, and I don't think uh, that that this that uh, and, I, and I and I don't think that engage with the setting so far. Uh, this is still a teaser though, so who knows? My opinion might change once more information is revealed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you never know if maybe like they'll put out a full trailer and they'll give you a bigger picture of what the series is going to be. So by that point, maybe it will give us an idea if this is an idea that is worth pursuing or if it is worth watching or not. But yeah, I mean, I'm in I'm in the same spot as you. It's just I don't know if I would be on board with this kind of idea. I mean, like, yeah, we're getting dragons, but we're not getting Burke along with it. Uh, let's see now. What else do we have here? The trailer doesn't have much. Uh, the, the trailer doesn't leave much to the imagination. But in regards to the storyline and eh, not a fan. I really like the Dragons movies, but this gives off major 2011 Smurf movies vibe, though it's clearly going to be that, so though clearly it's not going to be that bad. Uh, uh, so this is going to be a pass for me. If I want to watch a series set in the modern day that focuses on Norse mythology, I think I'm just going to stick with the Thor movies, except Dark World. Again, this show looks bad, but not that bad. Yeah, exa exactly. And one thing I got to mention, though, like one thing that is a little bit off for me, I will say like one thing that doesn't sell me so far is the animation. I don't know about you, but like even that little moment that we got of that animation, like right over here. That I, I don't know. 
about you, but in my opinion, that doesn't really look great. It didn't, you know, like, uh, like I know that DreamWorks could do, like, I understand it is a series, so I'm not, ex I'm not expecting the animation to be like on par with what we got with the How to Train Your Dragon movies. In fact, like, it would be hard to do so considering that the How to Train Your Dragon films have some of the best animation that DreamWorks has done so far, but like, I don't know, this animation feels pretty weak honestly like i've seen what they've done with stuff like troll hunters and tales of arcadia and that was absolutely gorgeous and seeing them go from that to this is honestly a little bit disappointing it's just that's also another factor that i feel pretty iffy it's just the animation feels pretty weak maybe even more so than what we've seen in like the previous uh shows actually because like i even heard like stuff like dragger or dragons writers of burke like that's a pretty solid show even my friends who are major dragon fans uh they they love the series as well so like even i would consider maybe to check that one out all right i think i'll read one more comment before we go into the grand finale of all of all of this uh let's see i was surprised that the franchise is coming back but in the modern world and i could see two things on one hand, it could work to see how dragons would fit in the modern world, but on the other hand, it could end up ruining what the franchise has established. I could see it either bad or good, but who knows? Exactly. I mean, so far, I, I, I feel like the big thing with this is that they need to do a lot more in order to convince us or convince me to see if this show would actually be worth pursuing, if this show is actually worth it, and if it's worth bringing the dragons to the modern world. All right, so now with that said, it is now time, folks, for the one and only, the grand finale. And when it comes to this grand finale in particular, this one, honestly, it made me a little bit upset. Not because of what the story is, but because of the fact that it came out literally while I was doing the podcast, but like last week, like this actually came out exactly a week ago while I was doing the podcast, talking about like what's going on in the animation and the entertainment world. And this thing just came out of nowhere. So with that said, now, like at least there's no better time like the present, better late than ever. So let's go and talk about the Disneyland movie. Yes, no joke, Disney is going to be making a movie about the creation of Disneyland. Now, this isn't going to be like a major big screen movie thing. Apparently, this is just going to be a feature that they will put out on Disney Plus, in which they are going to call it Happiest Place on Earth, which will chronicle the origins of Disneyland and the pursuit that Walt Disney went through in order to build Disneyland. And what's interesting to note is that they already got some people already working on this and already hired some people to work on the production. Uh, the biggest one and probably the weirdest addition that I will get a lot to later is actually regarding the director to which they brought in none other than David Gordon Green. Now, you might be wondering, why is it so weird that they got David Gordon Green in this? Like, what makes it so strange? What makes it so peculiar? Well, that is mainly regarding the fact that uh, David Gordon Green, well, he is definitely a, a versatile director. He worked on comedies. He worked on dramas. But his main thing is actually related to horror. In fact, uh, David Gordon Green actually just released his uh, brand new movie just a few days ago. This is the director of Halloween Kills. And yet, apparently, this is also going to be the guy who's going to be working on a movie based on Disneyland. Like, what the fridge? <laughs> uh, but apparently he's not going to be the only one who's going to be working on this movie. They do have a bunch of producers as well, um, including uh, Calvary Media, which consists of Jason Reed and Jessica Matthews. But also they do have a writer on this, uh, uh, on this movie, which is going to be none other than Evan Spiliotopoulos, in which he actually has a history 
of working with uh, Disney in the past. Now, he has already done some films before. He has already written some stuff like uh, The Huntsman, Winter's War, that Hercules movie with uh, Dwayne Johnson. And even this year, uh, there have been some movies with his script like The Unholy and Snake Eyes. But with Disney, uh, he already worked on films such as The Jungle Book 2, Pooh's Heffalump, uh, Pooh's Heffalump movie, Tinkerbell and the Lost Treasure, and even the live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast. And so far, we don't have any more information regarding when this is going to be happening, when this is going to come out, but all we do know so far is the fact that Disney will be working on a uh, Disneyland movie about the making of Disneyland movie and that it will have David Gordon Green. Now, one thing that I will say immediately is that I love this idea. I love the idea about a movie about the creation of Disneyland. As I said before, Walt Disney is just one of those figures that you could just take one certain aspect of his life and you could make a full feature film out of. In fact, we have already seen several that have already been done before. Like just just take the making or just take making Mary Poppins or just getting like make a movie about getting the rights of Mary Poppins and you could turn that into saving Mr. Banks or you could do the whole origins of uh, Walt Disney and uh, like his entire life before he created Mickey Mouse and you could turn that into something like Walt before Mickey even though I will admit that's not that great of a movie it is a very intriguing one I will say but uh, yeah honestly it, it's one of those where the book is better than the movie per se <laughs> but anyways, uh, in all seriousness, though, the creation of Disneyland, I honestly find that to be a very fascinating story, a story that has often been told a lot. In fact, uh, if you really want to learn about the origins of Disneyland, I highly recommend you watch the first episode of The Imagineering Story. It's on Disney Plus right now. The Imagineering Story is a great documentary, by the way, that tells uh, the whole story of uh, of Disney. You know, it, it tells the whole story of Di of the Disney parks in six very informative par uh, parts from the conception of Disneyland all the way up to before the pandemic, like up to uh Rise of Resistance. So th this is just to go and highlight, uh, like to to watch that, and especially the first part. It really does go in depth and does tell a very fascinating story about the development of Disneyland. And I think that would actually make a really good story about uh, how Walt Disney created Disneyland, especially like on the opening day, how it was considered a little disastrous when there were too many people that came in, especially like with counterfeit tickets that were being sold. So. Uh, like it was a little bit of a rocky start, but then, uh, people at Di the people at Disney and Walt Disney himself did manage to control it. And now, uh, the Disney parks has become a major empire in itself, or at least a piece from the big empire of Disney. So yeah, I would totally be down to see uh, a feature film all about the making of it. The one catch I feel uh, about this, though, the one thing that I'm a little bit iffy, it's regarding the people who are working on it. Like, for example, David Gordon Green. Now, this is not to say that he is a bad director. He has definitely done a lot of great stuff. It's just right now, in his current phase, he's not necessarily the kind of director you would expect to go and make a Disney biopic, especially right now when he's really leaning into his horror phase, where right now he's working on the recent Halloween movies, and not to mention working on plenty other horror-related stuff in the future, where he's also going to be working on a reboot of The Exorcist, he's going to be working on a uh, Hellraiser series. Like, right now... He's like he's pretty much on his uh, horror phase of his career. So it, it's not to say that this is a bad choice, but it is a bit of an unusual choice. Like, I, I know in his past, he did previously experimented with a lot of dramas and some comedies as well. So seeing him be involved with Disneyland, that it, it, it's an odd choice. I don't know how that's going to work, but we will wait and see, I guess. But then there is also... 
the writer as well, Evan Spiliopoulos. That is also a factor that for me, I would say it's a little bit iffy because so far, a lot of the movies that he has written, well, they're not necessarily the best per se. And especially when it comes to a lot of the mainstream stuff that he has written, a lot of them, well... Uh, they're not really good. You know, they're not so great. I mean, stuff like Snake Eyes and The Huntsman Winter's War, like it so far looks like a lot of the stuff that he has written are really for mainstream Hollywood stuff that, you know, the, like basically the run of the mill Hollywood productions that, you know, they just quickly come and go. They're not necessarily that noteworthy. Uh, the most noteworthy thing that he has done is the live action Beauty and the Beast movie. And really that, that film is just, eh. I mean, I could give him the benefit of the doubt because really for the most part, he's just doing what Disney is just telling him to do and just like, you know, like remake Beauty and the Beast, but make some unnecessary updates so like i could like you know i could buy that maybe it's not necessarily his fault and it is more because of executive decisions you know it, it really is more because of creative control that is beyond evan uh, spiliopoulos's uh powers but still though i don't know like the the dude doesn't have that much uh credit to go and like gain my trust to go and work on this, uh, to, to work on this movie. So really it's just a lot, like, honestly, w when it comes to all this, I, I just feel like I have a lot of mixed feelings. There isn't necessarily a whole lot to go and talk about because so far this is just a project that has been announced, but yeah, I just feel pretty mixed as much as I really do love this idea. I'm just not a hundred percent sure about the people who are going to work on this. And I mean, like it, it feels like a random mishmash of like random people to go and work on this. Like, yeah, I do understand because of, uh, of his connection with Disney and like why they would bring someone like e e Evan Spiliopoulos, but then, um, like you got David Gordon Green to direct this. I don't know, man, that that just seems like a strange concoction, especially at this point of his career. I mean, like, yeah, I'll, I'll be down to see like to see him be more experimental and do something beyond what he, what he's doing right now. Like it would definitely expand his uh, horizons. And if he can pull it off, then it would definitely be a great surprise. But for now, it's just I don't know. Like, I think that's going to be more something I'll have to wait and see. I'll definitely be enthusiastic to check to check this out as a Disney fan. But how it's going to be, will it be worth it? I don't know, man. It's just it just a lot of it just seems rather strange. All right. So with that said, right now, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, what do you think about this happiest place on earth what do you think about this disneyland movie are you guys excited to check it out are you guys weirded out by some of the creative choices um uh, like are, do you have confidence in the film in the filmmakers let me know what you all think okay let's see I might be a bit salty, but I just feel like another waste of millions of dollars. Um, I, I just feel like this is another waste of millions of dollars. Uh, if they wanted to tackle an, an interesting part of Walt Disney Studios history, maybe they could do one about the unlikely friendship between Walt and Sergei Eisenstein in the 1930s and make it a half documentary, half feature on Eisenstein's unfinished essay on Disney. Really interesting book, by the way. Plus, uh, it would be a good chance to reconciliate Russia and USA on their cu cultural differences. Well, I mean, yeah, like I said before, there are definitely plenty of other different factors of Walt's life that you can make a movie out of, not just his relationship with Sergei Eisenstein, but you can also make a movie based on his relationship with uh, with Leopold Stokowski, like make a whole movie about the making of Fantasia, or you can go and make um, a movie based on his relationship with Salvador Dali, for example. You could, you could do plenty of those, and I mean, I could see the appeal with, um, with, with the creation of Disneyland, I could see the appeal about a movie about Walt Disney trying to make Disneyland. That would definitely be a great idea. And I mean, 
an obvious choice since it is a major highlight of his entire life and one of the be- and one of like his greatest creations that he has ever done, like right up there with Mickey Mouse and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So, I mean, I do understand why he would why Disney would go and do this. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see what else we got. This was an unexpected turn of events, but I'm still kind of psyched. I'm probably more excited to see the twist of uh, that David Gordon Green takes on Disneyland, especially considering his latest films has been <coughs> far from family friendly. But still, it's a good concept, a good director, so I'm pretty sold. Uh, just as long as they don't bring back Tom Hanks as Walt. I mean, I love the guy and all, but he doesn't really fit the role. Yeah, I I do understand that. And I mean, like, his performance as Walt Disney in Saving Mr. Banks is great. There's no denying. But it is still Tom Hanks. And it's like, it's obvious that it's Tom Hanks. He certainly is no Walt Disney. Like, you you close your eyes and you just hear, like, you you just hear a calm and friendly Woody from Toy Story. You don't really hear Walt Disney. (laughs) All right, uh, let's see what else we got here. I think making a movie about how Walt Disney built the happiest place on Earth, a.k.a. Disneyland, is an an excellent idea. They did a documentary on Disney Plus called Disney Imagineering, or uh, I think you mean the Imagineering story, but I do kind of feel iffy for the people who are working on this movie. Uh, I'm not really into David Gordon Green's uh, movies because I'm not a fan of horror and always afraid of them. Uh, It's a pretty good idea for a Disneyland Chronicle movie, but having the people work on it sounds a bit eh. Either way. All right. uh, Let's see what else we got here. Um, Okay. Let me just ask why the fridge would they get the director associated with horror and a writer of some infamous Disney sequels like the jungle book Two? This is honestly conflicting on one hand. This could be a pretty good documentary, but on the other hand, this might be another finding Neverland. So yeah, well, no, I'm, well, this is not, keep in mind, guys, this is not a documentary. This is like a full on movie with actors trying to go like, I, like, I, I think that, yeah, they, they didn't state that this is a documentary. This is a legit movie with actors who are going to play roles such as uh, Walt Disney and Raleigh Klump and Mark Davis and all those guys. Like, it's a movie about that. It's not going to be a documentary. We already got plenty of documentaries about the making of Disneyland. All right, um, uh, let's see what we got here. So the director that made Pineapple Express and the recent Halloween films, such as the sequel, um, which I find to be a downgrade to the 2018 film, making this while the writer that wrote many directed video Disney sequels, along with 2014 Hercules and Snake Eyes. Yeah, I don't think this movie version will be good from the looks of it. Not saying it is doomed to fail type of movie, but I feel like it will be mediocre at best. So yeah. Uh, not confident with this one. Uh, yeah, so like you, you can definitely tell that it's really the people that are attached to it that makes it a bit conflicting more so than the concept. All right, I'll read uh, one more comment before we go and cap this off. And uh, I'm surprised no one's ever done a film on Disneyland. I could see a lot of potential with this story, especially uh, with the progress of building the parks and the disastrous opening day in 1955. I'm not familiar with David Gordon Green, but I like to see the perspective of how Disneyland was formed. Yeah, and I mean, if it is going to be something that will actually grab more attention or if it will highlight more of the story of how Disneyland is built, then, you know, I'm all for it. But either way, I guess we will ultimately have to wait and see. We're going to wait and see if this will work out, but... I will be, uh, you know, I will be optimistic and I will be excited to see how they will go because at the end of the day, hey, it's a movie about making Disneyland. I mean, sounds like fun, right? And with that said, I think that should do it for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. So I just want to say thank you all so much for joining me on this. It was definitely a blast. And let's hope we can have a lot more fun like this on to the next episode. So I would just like to say thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, see you later, dudes. And enjoy the surprise. Let's start this off with something we all know, but hasn't been said enough. Animation can be weird. I mean, 
Has it ever happened to you that you watch some cute cartoon where the characters go on a little adventure, and then suddenly... <laughs> yeah, that happens. But of course, in the world of animation, there are no rules and anything can be possible. Yet very few movies actually take advantage of that fact. There is a reason though. Since cartoons are famous for being wacky and over the top, giving them limitless control can result in something... <laughs> ...chaotic. However, while some do have to be contained, there are those whose surrealistic mannerisms and complete disregard to common logic and sense might actually be fun. And that's exactly what this entire list is all about. To dedicate the psychedelic, and of course, the completely weird. Now for this top 10, I'd like to remind you about three things about the movies that you're about to see here. Number one, there are no Japanese films, because that would be cheating. Number two, I made sure the movies in here are good, and despite their oddity, they are all worth your time. But I may get into some spoilers to some, so I'm just warning you now. And number three, this is not ranked by the best, but rather by the weirdness. Even if some are considered the greatest of all time, it can only be higher on the list depending on how bizarre it can be. So, with all that established, it is time to say goodbye to everything we know and literally shatter our reality as we enter in the forbidden world of animation. And yes, I do mean literally. I'm Animat. And welcome to the top 10 weirdest animated films.